Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another edition of the show. And uh, so we're going to do a little comparison of, of wine or of grapes that people seem to confuse the, the, because of the names of the grapes. You know, we're doing Petite Syrah and Syrah and we're going to kind of talk about them and talk about the differences and similarities and all that. Um, so we're going to, I went out and this is back in uh, October maybe? When did I buy this? October I think. Um, no, November. Bought it in November. Went over to HEB Central Market. That's kind of the high-end uh, supermarket. Uh, well, that's kind of the high-end stores of the supermarket HEB here in San Antonio and throughout much of Texas actually now. Um, but uh, this is the Central Market, which is in their Alamo Heights area. And they have a, they have a pretty good wine selection, um, pretty good supermarket wine selection. They have wines from quite a few different areas of the world, not just a heavy U.S. Uh, based uh, wine selection. So I went there because I wanted to get these two, you know, wines from these two grapes. Now, I could have gone to a few other places, but I, I wanted to go to Central Market because I hadn't gone there in a while and I thought I'd go there and I was pretty sure I would get exactly what I wanted. So uh, the idea is to get a Petit Syrah, a 100% Petit Syrah and a 100% Syrah, an old school Syrah, a Syrah from France. And I was actually able to do that. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start off with uh, we're going to start off with the Syrah. Um, both of these wines are around the same price, so uh, it's not like I'm necessarily going. I mean, I am going in order of price, you know, the lower the lower of the two, but it's they're only like a dollar difference, if that. So um, anyway, so uh, we're going to start with the Syrah. Now this on the label it says Crows Hermitage, uh, which is the area of Northern Rhone uh, in France, where this is from. Uh, it says Lacombe Close Reserve, um, Lacombe Close. And uh, that's about all that's on here in the vintage, 2010. Um, there's something on here about who distributes it, but um, apparently they don't distribute this wine anymore. Um, so, you know, whatever. So it was really hard to get information on this wine. I mean, like, impossible. And then I grabbed the then I grabbed the receipt. The receipt says Dom Fage. Dom Fage. So Domain Fage. Never heard of it, which is not unusual. So I Googled that, and what do you know? So um, found a Frank Fage of Domain Domain de Hos Chassis, or as you'd say it in American, Domain des Hots Chassis. All right. Um, the address is exactly the same, so I was like, score, found it. Uh, apparently this is, winery's been in existence for three generations. Uh, the current owner, Frank, um, is the, also the winemaker since 1998. He took over, he took it over from the family operation in 1998. Uh, was, I guess, part of the local co-op and left it in 2003 to go out on his own. Now, I couldn't find anything really, I didn't look too hard, because I did it right before I started filming. Um, but 2009, I found a vintage under, under the um, uh, De, De Haas Chassis. Um, so I'm not sure when it stopped, but 2010 is this vintage. So I don't know if he continued beyond 2009. I just don't, didn't see anything, so I didn't really look for any other vintages. Or in 2010, he decided to go back into the co-op, maybe. Um, but it was just kind of funny how HEB had the 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 name of the winemaker on here, and I couldn't find it under the Le Combe, uh, was it Le Combe, Le Combe Close, Close, whatever. I couldn't find it under that, so pretty hard. But anyway, so uh, that's about all I know about the winery. So let's kind of talk about the area of France. So uh, it's in the Drôme, or Drôme, uh, in Drôme, France. Um, it's a department, or the that 
area is a department or like a state kind of uh, around uh, Valence. And um, it's also within the, the uh, AOC uh, Cornas, which is also part of the Crow's Hermitage, was also part of the Rhone. Okay. Um, now this says Crow's Hermitage, so I'm going to assume that uh, there is some reason why they didn't put Cornas on here, but the winery that it comes from has 12 hectares. Um, in Cornas, there's 90 hectares of uh, vines, and there are some chateau in Bordeaux that have that produce more wine than the entire Cornas AOC. So, um, is 100% Syrah. Uh, if it says Cornas has to be 100% Syrah, this is 100% Syrah. It says so on the label, 100% 100% Syrah. Most likely, any other wine that says Syrah on there will probably be 100% Syrah, though, depending on the legal aspects of what they say, there might be other grapes in there. But Syrah is kind of the king of Rhone, let's put it that way, or one of the main grapes of the Northern Rhone, especially. Um, so I'm not sure if he could have, his other domain could have been called Cornas or not, but uh, it's one of the smallest AOCs in the Rhone. And uh, Cornas, as a little bit of a little bit of a, uh, whatchamacallit, um, trivia thing, is Celtic for burnt earth. So I'm not really sure about that. All right, so let's get into the wine. So Syrah, all right. Typical on the Syrah. I want an old world typical Syrah. Roll the dice that, you know, something from the Northern Rhone, Grosse Hermitage, would give me what I want. Kind of meaty, and you know, there's a baconness to it. Not a lot of fruit forwardness to it, which is again what I was looking for. But yeah, kind of like smoked meat, so barbecue-ish, cured meat, that kind of stuff. And these are the types of aromas that should that should really kind of make your world a lot smaller when you're trying to figure out what a wine is if you're doing a deductive tasting, aka blind tasting, um, that it should kind of pretty much kind of go, hey, the Rhone is probably where we're at. It could be other areas, but the Rhone is it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good guess. As far as any other woods, I mean, there's kind of a woodsiness to it. Um, other than that, there really isn't any fruit or any other earthiness to it. Just kind of just like some, like a brisket that's been smoked and cooked type of thing. Mm. This sticker isn't as banged up. Now, I just brushed my teeth about an hour ago, so, I mean, a first drink of wine can be kind of not the best, so we're going to do it again. Mm. Again, a real meaty wine. The palate fairly matches the uh, the nose. Um, there's a bit of acidity to it, kind of high in the acid. Again, that could be could be just you know uh, the initial attack of the of wine on my on my palate. I did have some wine earlier in the afternoon, about what four hours ago, five hours ago. So um, so there's been a good amount of time in between wine, but um, you know there's definitely a dryness to it. A um, bit of acidity to it. Like I said, it could be also, you know, from brushing the teeth and all that, but but it's still, it grips. Uh, you got that meatiness to it. Again, not really much fruit going on here. I mean, we'll go generic red fruit, but um, it's, it's pretty meaty. I mean, this is something that if you had a brisket, if you had ribs, if you had a barbecue of some type, uh, sausage, all that kind of stuff, roast, you know, pot roast, um, stew, any of that kind of stuff, you're you're gonna it's gonna really complement it extremely well. Like now, I want to have some some pot roast, carrots, potatoes, nice brown gravy, good stuff, right?
palate's calming down a little bit. The, the, the wine is really coating it. Yeah, I mean, good stuff. I mean, uh, paid, I'm sorry, I forgot to say, I paid $24.95 for this. So not inexpensive, uh, pretty good. When I looked at the, um, uh, the other domain, um, one of the wines was about 20 bucks online. So we're right in, the, right in the ballpark of probably his entry level uh, effort. Uh, looked like he had a little bit, he had one that was a little bit better, but I didn't see what the price was on that. But I like it, I like it a lot. I mean, I really would like to have some food with it. This is not, a, to me, this is not a wine you just drink on its own. You gotta put some food with it. Like I said, barbecue is a great pairing with this. Just anything hearty. I like it a lot. If you can find this, again, it's a pretty generic name. Um, so again, it might be a co-op thing. Um, if you can find this at your local market or local wine shop, I recommend it. It's 25 bucks. I'd probably wish it was about five bucks cheaper, especially knowing that he made a $20 bottle of wine. So, and I don't know, maybe the higher end wine was $25, but you know, maybe it was like five bucks off, be a little bit better, but still I would recommend it. Um, again, a good classic example of what a wine from this area should exhibit. All right, so now we're gonna move on to wine number two. All right, moving on to wine number two. Now, this is a winery that is pretty well known. It doesn't hurt that there's an AVA also with the same name. The winery came first, by the way, which happens in California. So uh, there's at least two off the top of my head I can think of. Actually, I actually think there's a couple more. But um, anyway, so this is the Stag's Leap 2010 Napa Valley Petite Syrah. All right, so we got that. Now, what's the, what's the old Stag's Leap? Stag's Leap is not an inexpensive wine. They make some pretty pricey wines too, but this one, uh, I paid $25.97 at Central Market. Um, so again, not inexpensive. And uh, I bought it, one, based upon the name. Stag's Leap, I figured Petite Syrah. It was actually, I think, one of the only 100% Petite Syrah I could find at the store. And I knew, that, I knew the label. I've never had this from them. So doing my research. Um, well, first of all, there's an AVA called Stag's Leap, and then you have the Stag's Leap Winery. Uh, it was, uh, if it was founded, uh, well, in the 1890 was, or 1880, I think I saw in 1880, 1890, the manor house was built around then. So before the, before the turn of the century, and then it was really in a, a resort in the early, uh, 20th century. Um, it was sold, it was founded by Horace Chase and Minnie Misner Chase. And then um, it was sold to Mrs. Francis Grange in 1913. Now they were producing wine at the time. Uh, they stopped production during Prohibition. Um, and then there was a revitalization of the winery in the 70s. A gentleman by the name of Carl Dumani uh, purchased it in 1971. And the Petit Syrah is apparently their signature wine. I didn't know this. So it's kind of the cool thing about doing this show is I find stuff out. And yeah, you know, some of these things, like especially famous labels, I guess people would assume I would already know these things, but since I don't drink all these things and I, my concentration actually tends to not be new world, they tend to gravitate towards old world wines. Um, a lot of the Napa and Sonoma, a lot of the California big names, I know in name only, I've never actually had. And I don't even know a lot about some of those big names. It's kind of, oh yeah, it's a well-known thing. So kind of cool things about the show is since I force myself to have stuff I've never had, just check it out. Uh, now, the uh, winery was sold to Behringer in 97. Uh, 2000 bought by Foster's, as in the Foster's Group of Australia. And then Treasury Wine Estates bought Foster's. Um, I, think they bought, they, I think they bought Foster's and they don't have it anymore. But anyway, it's, the winery is now owned by Treasury Wine Estates out of Australia. All right. Um, it was also apparently the first AVA based on the terroir, on the unique terroir. Uh, and it was established in 1989. So uh, what else about the AVA? There's 20 different wineries there. Um, and the Cabernet Sauvignon from Stag's Leap was the red wine winner in the Judgment of Paris from 1976. Um, now, if you ever watched uh, Bottle Shock, they really focus on uh, Chateau Montalena, which had the Chardonnay, and they were the number one. They were, they were the white wine winner. Stag's Leap was the, the, the cab was the winner uh, for that. So that's pretty cool. 
and their grapes have been planted there since the 1870s. So, Petite Syrah. We're going to get to this in a little bit with the difference between the two are. Okay, so nothing like, I want to say nothing. It's, it, you definitely don't get the Syrah stuff. You don't get all the meat and the barbecue and the cured stuff. Um, actually, it was, it, it's actually kind of creamy. I mean, there's there's a bit of there's a bit of fruit to it. It's it's kind of I'm gonna go say generic red fruit on this. Let's kind of do my Israeli. Yeah, just kind of like really on generic on the red fruit. You know, maybe raspberry, cranberry. I don't know about cranberry, but raspberry ish, maybe blackberry. There does seem to be a bit of vanilla to it. I think I'm catching a whiff of pepper, as in like pyrazine on the pepper, not white pepper, black pepper, but like green pepper. So I'm seeing I can get a hint of that. Nothing floral, nothing over on the wood other than the vanilla that would uh, indicate some wood treatment. And that, I mean, the nose is the nose is nose. I, I it's I don't I don't enjoy the nose as much as I enjoy the the Syrah nose. The tannins seem to be bigger on this. It uh, coats the mouth more. Um, Feels juicier. Um, there seems to be kind of this this balance between a little earthiness and, and fruit fruit flavor. Um, again, the fruit is I, I'm going to say probably more of a, a raspberry blackberry, probably more blackberry, so darker fruits um, than uh, than brighter red fruits. Nothing, no cherries, no cranberries, none of that. More of a blackberry. Um, I don't think any blueberry, but that type of stuff. Um, and a bit of earthiness, but not like meatiness. Not nothing. Nothing. Uh, um, not, I don't want to say savory, but I guess that's what I'm looking for. Acid is. It's probably about medium acid, so it doesn't taste as acidic as the first one. Now, we're going to go back to the first one real quick and kind of compare that because and now that I've had a couple mouthfuls of wine, things might be calmed down. But, um, you know, I, I find it's a nice balance of, of flavors. It's not it's not too over the top. You've got a bit of fruit. You've got a bit of earthiness to it. Um, nothing like floral to it. But, um, you know, this is a wine I would sit there, and if I was in a, in a blind tasting... I would probably have a hard time deciding what it was. Um, this is one why I did the Petit Syrah because it is not a wine, especially on its own. It's it tends to be a blending grape, um, but on its own, it's to me, it's difficult. I have no idea how to identify it on its own. I don't. I haven't had a lot of Petit Syrahs in you know to to go on. Um, you know, it, it could. I could easily make call this about any other red wine out of California. I mean, I would probably call it New World. I might even call it California. Um, I probably wouldn't, you know, I probably wouldn't confuse it with Australian Shiraz, but, you know, I could see calling this, you know, a few different things um, as far as the darker or the, the heavier red wines like Cab Merlot, uh, probably not Zin, you know, um, because of the pyrazine, I might go the Cab route on the, on the aroma, but I don't get it on the palate. So I'd probably be really confused. So I'd probably be going, well, I don't know, it's got this, this, this. But none of those fit into anything that, that would go with the red wine side of things. Um, so then I would probably start struggling because I probably wouldn't know what to think. And Petit Syrah would probably not be on my list of things to think about. So it's kind of, I guess, one of those things where it, it doesn't fit anything. So maybe it must be Petit Syrah is one of the choices that you would think of, especially if you're going New World.
It's a good wine. I like it. Um, 26 bucks. Like it. I don't know. You're talking Stag's Leap. You're talking a premium area of, of, of California. You're talking uh, an old school winery. Um, big name. Um, it's their signature wine. Or they call it their signature wine. Um, or the wine, that I guess, that got them started. Um, this is a wine that I could drink on its own. Um, but I would probably want to pair with, uh, just pair with kind of, honestly, the traditional red wine type of stuff. So we're talking steaks. Um Maybe a red sauce, maybe a meat sauce. If you're doing pasta, you could probably do that. There's enough acidity to it so that you could do like you would do a Chianti. So enough acidity to it. Again, it's not over the top acidity, but it's a pretty decent, say medium, almost medium plus. Because I got a lot of, I got a lot of uh, saliva going there. I know that was awesome to hear, right? So I'm just gonna try the uh, the Syrah on its own real quick. Let's just kind of see if how how the uh, acid is it's still got a bit of bite to it um i'd even say maybe almost a little bit of va to it volatile acidity um which i find in texas wine so that's i think where when I have Syrahs and I have Texas wines, I get that type of, you know, I, I've, I feel that Syrah or, or, the, or wines from that area of, of uh, France remind me of, of wines I've had from Texas. So, but not in a bad way, okay? So pretty good stuff. All right, so we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do a very brief Syrah versus Petite Syrah segment. Um, there wasn't a whole lot to do. It's not going to be a full 10 to 15 minute comparison. So we're going to do that here uh, on the next segment. All right. So what's the difference between this petite Syrah and the Syrah business? As you can see, I don't have the green screen going. Um, I might have the slides over here. I'm not really sure if I'm going to do that or not, but I kind of went old school really, to be honest. I was trying to get this done quickly and didn't want to take the whole time to set up everything. And the house is still a little bit not where it was um, with holidays and and uh, uh, having company over in January. We actually literally just took down the Christmas tree yesterday or day before. So um, if you see some sparkles on here, that's from that. Anyway, um, so uh, so wine so wine 101, Petite Syrah versus Syrah. Now, first of all, we're going to talk about there's there's Petite Syrah, P E T I T, and then maybe S I R A H or P-E-T-I-T-S-Y-R-A-H, or P-E-T-I-T-E-S-I, -E -E you know, you, you get it, okay? Between the two words, there's four ways to spell this thing that you might see. And they have Syrah, S-Y-R-A-H. So let's talk about the grapes. So we're gonna talk about Petite Syrah first. Why? Because that's the order I did it in. No, no particular order. A uh, Petite Syrah is a cross between the Syrah grape and a grape called Pelorsan. Um, now this is, so you'll have people say, well, it's called Petite Syrah because it's a small version of Syrah, or it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not, it's not a child of Syrah. It's, it's a Syrah that's like a, you know, a clone or, or an, an offshoot, but it's, it's not like Syrah and some other grape got together and had some fun in the vineyard. So you'll have people say, well, it's just a smaller version of Syrah. It's the same thing. Well, it's not. Okay, um, <clears throat> the botanist Francois Durif, Durif um, is the one who is credited with this. It was in his vineyards that this happened or that they can trace it to. Um, the official name is Plant du Rif, as in, and then it's also Durif, 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 probably Durif. Anyway, um, that is the official name is Durif or Durif, I don't know, maybe in the United States is called Durif, not Petite Syrah. That, so when you, if you go to the TTB, um, you might find Petite Syrah somewhere, but when they list grape names, uh, Durif or Durif is what you'll find uh, as the list of grapes. So um, it is misspelled all kinds of ways, but Petite Syrah, as in P-E-T-I-T-E-S-I-R-A-H, like it's spelt here, 
is the correct spelling of it. Um, it's just a matter of, I mean, you see it on these labels, and I guess that it's frustrating because you'll have, especially they'll, they'll put P-E-T-I-T-E and S-Y-R-A-H on the label. Well, it's not a petite Syrah. It's a petite Syrah. Got it? Um, Petite Syrah with the Y, S-Y-R-H, was a term that they that immigrant vine growers in 1878 used for lower yielding Syrah uh, vineyards back in California. Um, this grape didn't get into California until 1884. So that's also where you have the confusion of the names. You have somebody using the S-Y-R-H thinking that's what it's called because that's what the, the term was being used. But in reality, People were using that as a, it was just a lower yielding, uh, lower yielding vineyards with Syrah, and they were calling it Petite. Um, Australia and USA are the two main countries that, that actually grow and, and produce Petite Syrah. However, there are other countries out there in the world that will they'll do it, but United States and Australia are the two that are the main, uh, main countries. Now, Syrah. Syrah is one of the big daddies of grapes. I mean, it's, you know, when, when, you're, when you're talking about grapes um, and like the, the main grapes that people know about, Syrah is, is in the same company as Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, okay, as far as the reds, um, plus Pinot Noir and all the other ones. But when it is definitely one of the big main grapes out there to make wine. It is from France, from the Northern Rhone. Um, it is an offspring itself, as I'm sure... Other grapes are, I mean, Cabernet Sauvignon is an offspring of Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. Um, of two grapes called Dureza and Mandus Blanche. Um, don't know anything about those grapes, I'll be honest. Um, and honestly, there is no reason for me to know anything about those grapes at this point. Um, now, you may have also heard the term Shiraz, or as they say in Australia, Shiraz. And that's why I use, and that's why I use Shiraz, because they're the ones that attach the name to the Syrah grape. Now, uh, there's thinking of how do you get Shiraz at a Syrah, and it's called a strinization, um, which is an Australianification, another way to say that, um, where the Australian accent takes Syrah and, and messes it up and you get Shiraz out of it. Um, and it, it's actually not Syrah, from um, Cycras. S-Y-C-R-A-S is another name for the Syrah grape. Apparently on records in England and Australia, they were using that word. And the Australians, I guess, had a hard time figuring out how to pronounce it. And Shiraz came out of it. I'm not really sure. Um, now, there is this myth. Like I said, this is from France. There is a myth or one of these legends. And you'll have people sit there and go, well, you know... The Syrah grape comes from Shiraz, Iran. No, it doesn't, dude. Sorry. Sorry to burst your bubble there. It doesn't come from there. And that's actually been a, a I mean, I've only been really studying wine for a few years, but that's been kind of a, a thing that there were a lot of people kind of really touting as it was. Now, granted, the past 10 to 20 years with all this DNA, DNA testing, you're really able to figure out where these grapes are coming from. And while they're was wine made in that area um, back in the day, as in like thousands of years ago. Um, it is not from the Shiraz town of Iran. Um, so it's a myth. Plain and simple, it's a myth. Uh, Associate, now it is, this grape is, like I said, it, it's, it, Syrah grape is grown all over the place. Like I said, Australia, they, they say it's Shiraz. There, you will find some places in the United States and California they will call it Shiraz. Um, and, I, and I always say Shiraz. I just, it's just how I do. Just because that's the Australian way to say it. Um, you'll find some places they'll say it, they do that. Uh, it's grown in, Shiraz grown in all, pretty much anywhere you grow red wine, anywhere red wine grapes are grown, you're going to find Syrah somewhere there. Uh, but it's really, really associated with the Northern Rhone. So the Hermitage, Crow's Hermitage, Cornos, Cote Roti, those are the big ones. Now, that's all Northern Rhone. Get to Southern Rhone, we get to Chateauneuf de Pop and those types of things. Um, it is one of the grapes, one of the 13 grapes for Chateauneuf de Pop. Uh, and you will find it in the Southern Rhone. But really, the Northern Rhone is where it, it's, it's kind of its home, its, its base, it's where 
you know, if you like, if you get all those things that I got out of the out of the Syrah, you're you're going to go Northern Rhone. You're probably not going to go Southern Rhone. You might. Don't know. Um, if you say Rhone, you, you, you're, you're correct. If you say Northern Rhone, you're more correct. If you can say this, well, you guessed right. Uh, I'll, you know, but uh, anyway, um, but those are the areas that is it is the best known. And honestly, that's all there is what you say about the grapes unless I'm not doing some master's thesis on it. I mean, otherwise I can go a little bit farther on it. But um, that's going to do it for this little segment on the two grapes. I hope you found it informative. I hope you found uh, the wines intriguing enough to go out and check out. Obviously, the Stag's Leap will be a little bit easier to find. Um, it's a very well-known brand. Uh, this one, I'm going to guess um, if it's the same domain with 12 hectares. Um, it may not be as widely distributed out there. Uh, you may not be able to find it exactly like this, but um, if you can find something that says 100% Syrah from the Crow's Hermitage or just Northern Rhone area, period, um, check it out, especially if you're going to have some type of barbecue or stew or pot roast, those kinds of hearty meals, especially this time of year. Uh, totally, totally go for that. Well, that's going to do it for now. Um, this is episode 289, right? So 11 more till 300. Stay tuned for announcements for 300 as we get closer to it. Uh, I've got some great stuff in the works, so uh, check out uh, the webcast, the podcast, whatever the show, um, and Twitter and Facebook for that. Uh, hopefully we'll have some details within the next couple weeks or at least uh, some beginning details on it. As always, thanks for stopping by, and we'll see everyone again next time.